Hello and welcome to another edition of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. And you know, we've been wanting for some time to have an episode featuring a Canadian woman entrepreneur. Because it seems to us there are more and more dynamic, creative and courageous women starting their own businesses in the 21st century. Well, we didn't have to look very far. Here in Toronto, Joanna Griffiths has pretty much set the world on fire with her now 10-year-old company called Nix, which offers an expanding line of women's intimate apparel that initially confronted and solved an age-old issue for women of all ages. Joanna's success has been phenomenal, and it's only just begun. Joanna Griffiths, I know you're a very busy woman, so we appreciate your taking the time for Canada Files today. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Jim. Many young women like you, when you started out, go into the supposedly glamorous world of entertainment and PR, and you did for a few years, but one would hardly think that's the foundation for starting a business in women's undergarments. Tell us how you moved on from one world and into the next? It's a great question and maybe not something I've reflected on all that often. Um, I started my career in, in media and entertainment. I worked at a large record label and had for all intents and purposes the, the dream job for someone coming out of university. Um, but you know what, what I took away from, from that experience and having worked with some of the top celebrities in the world really is that at the end of the day we're all just people and we have one life. And it's kind of up to us what we want to use that life for, how we want to use the platforms that we build, how we want to apply ourselves. And what I found was that I was either really inspired by the work that people were doing and the change that they were instilling in the world, or I was pretty disenfranchised and felt like, you know, what a waste. Um, and so I guess that gave me the confidence to really recognize that at the end of the day, we're all just people and it's up to us what we want to do with our voice and our platform. Um, and so I went back to school to do an MBA and had big dreams of running a media company someday. And as it turns out, I had a bigger dream, which was starting Nix um, and a bigger calling. So I was grateful for that opportunity. And what led to starting a women's undergarments business? I, know. <laughs> I always say I'm the most unlikely person to have done this because I I worked in media and entertainment. I'd never worked with a product before, physical product. I always worked with people or stories. Had no experience in apparel, um, but I had, an, I had an idea, and I had an idea to create and invent what is now leak-proof underwear, something that didn't really exist at the time and that by 2026 is gonna be a $1.6 billion category. Amazing. And uh, wild, right, <laughs> really. Um, and I had this idea and I knew that it was something that a lot of people needed but when I started doing the research, when I started talking to people, interviewing people, um, really understanding sort of how big the need was for this product in this category, I felt like, okay, well, this is, this is my chance to make a difference. This is my chance to kind of make the most of things and um, ended up moving forward with, with the idea and starting NYX and uh, haven't looked back since. But identifying the problem mm -hmm. and coming up with a solution yeah and then actually putting that solution into practice is like trying to jump the Grand Canyon. I'm sure you'd agree that that's probably what you went through. I mean, first of all, you need the guts to do it, you need the time to do it, and of course you need the seed capital to get it started. How did all of that fall into place for you? Yeah, so I, I started by just talking to people. So I had this idea and really wanted to, to validate if this was something that people would be interested in. So I did a lot of what's called digital anthropology, which is a really snazzy way of saying online kind of creeping and spending time in chat rooms and forums and getting people to talk to me about pretty intimate and, and personal things. Um, what I discovered through that research was two huge things within the intimate apparel market. So the first one was products really hadn't evolved. So despite all of the innovation that we'd seen everywhere else in the world, women's intimates really hadn't changed very much. The most recent innovation had been the thong, which I don't expect you to understand, but as a woman really leaves a lot to, to be desired. And then the second kind of big theme that I picked up on, and this was right when Instagram was starting to take off, but still really early, 
was if you really talk to people, the entire Intimates landscape was making them feel not included, like they didn't belong, like they weren't enough. And out of you know all of the different industries and sort of players, the role that some of the big intimate apparel behemoths were playing in devaluing women, in damaging their self-esteem and hurting their self-confidence, I just really felt like there was an opportunity to reinvent products and then reinvent what a brand can be. Why do you think, though, uh, through all these years, I mean centuries, that women's undergarments, until Nick's came along, were so fundamentally badly designed, specifically in relation to the issue you've identified? Yeah, so, you know, when I did the, so I'll, there's two things there. So the first one is, I don't necessarily think that intimates were badly designed, I just think that the purpose was wrong. So a lot of intimate apparel products and lingerie was being designed to be worn for five minutes. It was being designed to appeal to men instead of to appeal to the person that was wearing it. So when we create products, we think about how does our customer feel in five minutes in and 15 hours in? Is this actually delivering the promise? Is it making their life easier? Is it making their day better? So it was switching the lens of who these products are designed for, and instead of them being designed ultimately for the observer, it was being designed for the wearer. The second is that up until very recently, menstruation leaks, like these are some of the last big taboos that just weren't spoken about. And actually it's quite common when you look at the broader landscape that women's issues, health issues, have oftentimes been overlooked. And so because it wasn't part of what was socially acceptable to talk about things like menstruation, to talk about these things, no one really was working on a solution because it wasn't part of the cultural zeitgeist. And so what you've seen now is this huge and really, really inspiring onslaught of femtech products and companies that are reinventing products specifically to, to meet this growing consumer base that has some real needs that have been overlooked for years. Do you think you've been either the generator of a lot of those new femtech products or were you just one of the early adopters? I think a little bit of both. So I think that in business, in the world more broadly speaking, we all benefit from role modeling. We all benefit from seeing others that look like us, that sound like us succeed. I know I was greatly impacted by Sarah Blakely who started Spanx and her journey um, building, building Spanx, youngest self-made female billionaire in the United States, and just authentically herself. So I think that when we see others succeeding, we start to change the narrative. We start to believe this could be possible for me. And then the funders, the, the people with the money who are backing these companies, also start to identify, oh, hey, there's something going on here, and we should change the way that we're pattern matching, so to speak. At the start, mm -hmm. talking about fundraising, yeah. you would have been one of the very first people, certainly in Canada, to do serious money raising through crowdfunding, which is essentially the online version of passing the hat. I mean, you're getting 100 bucks from somebody here and 25 bucks from somebody there. It's not normally the way you raise money to start a new business. Did crowdfunding provide you with the seed capital that you needed to get going or did you have to go to other sources as well? It helped. I mean, I went to every source. I think every founder and entrepreneur that you speak to will say that you have to literally pound on every single door to kind of get the resources that you need. You know, one of the other problems that uh, entrepreneurs and startup companies run into is how to meet initial demand, especially if your product just you know, hits the mark and demand is huge. How did you manage growth and supply in those early years? Not well, to be honest. <laughs> Good for you for yeah, admitting that. Sure. Yeah, it, um, it took us a while to figure that piece out. And I, I think part of that has to do with the journey that I, I took with our company to begin with. So I spent the first three years of building Nick selling to wholesale partners. So relying on third parties to sell our brand and sell our products. What that did was it really removed us from the end consumer that we wanted to connect with so badly. And so we got good at things, broadly speaking. We started seeing tremendous success when we made the very difficult decision to cut 
70, 80% of our revenue to pull out of the 800 stores that we were in and to focus just selling online. We basically started over because we had to do less in order to do more. And that was a lesson that I learned along the way. I learned the power and importance of saying no. So you are now in the marketplace selling products against well-established, long-established brand names, including perhaps most universally known, would be Victoria's Secret. And you kind of mentioned that you know, some of the brands that you started up against were selling to a very different kind of, not necessarily market, but with a different uh, mindset, I suppose. And Victoria's Secret has been seducing women and men uh, for, what, 40 years with a very different marketing approach. Is Nix, do you think, upending the women's lingerie market? I think we forced a lot of change, and that's something I'm really proud of. I think that when we started Nix and started with this idea of really making sure that customers felt seen in our marketing, that they were co-creating the brand with us, that was pretty unique. You know, we were the first brand to use our customers in our photo shoots, the first brand to show what a product looks like on every single size, the first, there's countless firsts. What I've seen happen over the past decade is that the tables have turned, and I think that's actually a really positive thing. So that kind of community different approach, ensuring inclusivity and diversity in your marketing, that was a very strong point of difference for us in the beginning. Now it's table stakes. We've come so far and demanded so much change that now it says more when you're not doing that than when you are. And so I do think that there's been a profound amount of change that's taken place within the industry. And I think that what we've done is we've shown customers that they have a voice, that they have a role, and that they're worthy of being included and represented. And once you empower people to feel that way, you start demanding more of the competition. You, you mentioned that when you started out, you were first, your business model was to sell through stores through wholesalers and ultimately getting into department stores, women's stores, and then you stopped that, went online only, but now you've done a, an, a, bit, a bit of an about face in that you've started your own bricks and mortar operation. Is that now an area of expansion focus for you or are you just doing that in certain markets where you think it's more convenient, but online will still be the, the main business driver. We're always going to be digital first. I think that it's, it's where our, our roots came from and um, how we are able to connect with so many people. But in part of listening to our customers, we found that there is still a large group of people that want to touch and feel the product. They want help with sizing. They want to go to a retail environment that they feel really comfortable in. And so that's how we've set up our store strategy. We've sort of followed our consumers and have set up stores in the markets where people are really asking us for it. Well, all the while you've been making these decisions and facing these challenges, you've built a very successful company. Tell me just basically what are your metrics now? What are your annual sales? How many employees do you have? What is the geographical scope of Nix? Yeah, so we do nine figures in, in revenue a year um, and have been for, for quite some time now. What, what do you mean by nine figures? North of revenue in excess of the hundreds of millions of dollars. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, that's my Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> We're all very shy. Yes, the world uh, needs to know Canadians are shy. I think the things. last time that we looked, we sell an item every six seconds online. So millions of customers that choose to shop from our brand, which is something that I, I don't take lightly. Um, and then I believe our team is around 250 people now. Well, again, all the while you've been building a huge company, you have been becoming a mother of three children with twins, no less. You're certainly not alone in being a mother and a businesswoman. How do you, though, manage a multi-million dollar company along with the responsibilities of being a mom I and a, a wife? Yeah, I, I get a lot of help. And I think that that's something that we need to say more often than less. So I have a tremendous nanny that's a key part of our family that helps me every single day. I have a really supportive partner and extended family. 
and then I'm comfortable in chaos. I think every entrepreneur sort of has to live in that world and believe me, Jim, I, when I found out I was going to have three kids under the age of two, I was like, okay, <laughs> like, not everything has to be this intense in my life. But I think we're made for it. Um, and so I'm comfortable in chaos. I get a lot of help and I give myself a lot of grace. You might have created some chaos for, for, for yourself when you went out on a capital raising campaign a couple of years ago. I think you were pregnant with your twins. And you met with a number of venture capital firms throughout North America. But in going to those meetings, you had one stipulation that you put forward which related to possible attitudes from, uh, coming from men. Explain what that was and how it went over at the time. Sure, um, so about a year ago, we set out to, to do our first significant capital raise for Nix because we've been um, really capital efficient since starting the brand. I, ra I was raising the money while I was expecting twins. Um, I think our deadline to close was the Friday and I delivered my girls on the Monday. So really cutting it close. The rule that you're talking about was just this idea that anyone in the process who questioned my ability to build a company and be a mother was cut from the process. So they had no place, space, or opportunity to be owners, investors in, in Nix. And the rationale behind that was pretty simple. If that's what they questioned, then they obviously didn't understand what Nix is about and what I'm about, and ultimately wouldn't be champions of us sort of delivering against our mission. When you became a mother, you discovered uh, pretty quickly that nursing your babies was not as easy as you might have thought it had been because like everybody else, you'd seen pictures in magazines of serene mothers with beautiful babies at their breasts and uh, all looking happy and content. And you found that that wasn't the case for you. But you did something about it. What, what did you do from that experience? So I um, kicked off a project that we called the Life After Birth Project, which was a traveling photography exhibit, ultimately became um, a coffee table book. And what we did was we brought together the stories of, of life after birth. So what the postpartum experience really is like, honoring that every person's journey is different, both to get to the point of becoming a parent um, as well as their experience after, and really shining a light and building community around these collective experiences that make people know that they're not alone. Um, I think a, a common thread that I've seen throughout Nix is just this notion that um, women are expected to have it all. So, but it can't be hard, right? Even, even the stigma behind periods, this notion of you know, have this monthly experience, but don't complain about it, don't talk about it, don't pretend like it's not happening is very indicative of the pressure that we put on women in society in general. And so a lot of what we've done at Nix has been encouraging people to say, it's okay to talk about the good, the bad, the journey, the process. And actually in doing so, we might all end up collectively being stronger. And by that, do you mean not just including postpartum? I mean, it's just basically women's issues and we have to recognize what they are. And do you plan to expand on that campaign? I mean, beyond yeah. women's apparel? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's so funny because we sell underwear, but that's not really what we do at Nix. No one who comes to work at Nix views that as their job. We're here to empower our community to be unapologetically free. And to do that, we have to change the narrative. We have to help undo the damage that's been done by our industry and the collective sort of media at large of time and time and time again telling people that they're not good enough and they're not worthy enough. So we've tackled a bunch of different things in isolation, be it inclusivity, diversity, body positivity, fertility, the postpartum experience. And then most recently, we released a campaign called Big Strong Woman, which just honors all of the ways that women are big and strong by showing up, by learning to love ourselves in a society that tells us not to, by enduring sort of all of these different pressures, writing our own path, redefining what society expects of us, and really hoping that people take a minute and they just feel proud and good, of them, good about themselves. From 
the last 10 years and your success in building this company and taking on issues like you've just described. What have you learned about yourself that you probably didn't know existed? Oh, I, I mean, I've been so lucky. I've, I've really grown up alongside Mix. I've been on this journey. Um, I would not be the person I am today if it weren't for our customers in our community. I say that like every time we, we photograph a customer, we involve them in our campaigns. That harm, harm that kind of self-doubt in myself undoes just a little bit more. Um, so what have I learned? I'm, I'm a lot tougher than I think I gave myself credit for. I'm a lot more resilient. I've learned to sort of step into this seat of using my voice, using my platform, using that opportunity to ultimately deliver what it was that I learned from working in music, which is that this is my one shot, this is my one chance to have an impact, and I've learned to use Nix and all of the resources and tools that we have available to make that impact be as profound as possible. And what have you learned about running a business that perhaps you didn't get out of doing your MBA? So much. <laughs> uh, everything takes 10 times longer than you think it's going to take. Um, you can accomplish, I love this saying, which is people underestimate what they can accomplish in a year and they, um, sorry, people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and they underestimate what they can accomplish in 10. And I think that that's been universally true for Nix. Um, one of the things that I didn't fully appreciate uh, until recently is the importance of team, the importance of surrounding yourself with incredible people who share a passion and a vision. Where Nix is today is a byproduct of hundreds of people that work at our company. It's not just me anymore. Um, and so that's been a great learning along the way. One thing you probably would have learned in MBA school is that uh, there is a lot of historical evidence of the fact that entrepreneurs, the people with the ideas and the energy to, to get them launched, don't necessarily make good CEOs. And here you are, the entrepreneur, you got it up and running, and now you're the CEO. Do you sometimes sit in your office or lie in bed at night going, I don't know if I can do both roles? Constantly. I think a, a certain sense of being on your toes and checking in is, is something that's really important. I think the second that people feel like they've got it in the bag is when things usually tend to fall apart. I'm always asking myself that question. I'm always asking myself, am I the best person for this job? Can I really take this company where it, it deserves to go and it has the potential to go? And for the time being, that answer is yes. Uh, and I'll stick in this seat for as long as that makes sense. So what's ahead for Nix for the next five to 10 years? Growth of the product line, uh, expansion of the product line, perhaps into non-undergarments, perhaps acquisition of uh, another competitive or similar type company, or conversely, as so many startups will do, being acquired by a bigger and larger conglomerate or even competitor. I mean, where do you go from here? Well, I'm not going to show all of my cards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question, uh, Jim. No, I, I, you know what? I think that the amazing thing about Nix is that every day we feel like we're just getting started. And so doing what we're doing, bigger, bolder, um, reaching more people, and following what our customer says. I mean, ultimately, that's what's gotten us to this point, and that's where we're going to continue to go going forward. We've expanded our assortment a lot. We've entered into activewear and swimwear. Um, you know, we, we sort of really encompass the entire Intimates landscape and activewear landscape at this point in time. We'll, we'll continue to be guided by our customer and what it is that they want. You know, our Canadian viewers will be very pleased to know that, of course, you're Canadian. You wouldn't be on the Canada Files if you weren't. But Nix began in Canada. Uh, it's still headquartered in Canada. You and your husband Dave and your kids live in Canada and will presumably continue to do so. So you're proud Canadians and your company is proudly Canadian. Let me ask you though, a uh, question I ask all our guests on Canada Files. What does being Canadian mean to you? Oh, such a great question. For me, ultimately, I think it's about the values that I've learned living in this country, which is to practice humility, to really be a community advocate and player, 
and to be proud of where we've come and what we've built. That's what keeps me here is I think the people are incredible. I think that we're open to admitting our mistakes and always learning, growing, and evolving. I think we've seen that more than ever over the past couple years, which has been an incredible thing to see. Um, and I think there's a sense of camaraderie and pride that comes from living in this country. Well, I agree with you 100%. Joanna, thank you so much for your insights and your charm. Uh, that's probably a chauvinistic thing to say, but I, <laughs> okay. but I genuinely mean it. Thanks for being with us on Canada Files. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time with another edition of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of the North Pine Foundation, as well as the following donors. Akito Investments Inc., the Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, Michael and Mary Ellen Horgan, Ted and Alice Kernahan, David and Cheryl Carr, Philip B. Lind, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Francis and Eleanor Shen, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.